Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to um, this film forum, the last one of this semester. And we're going to start with, with the Q&A, um, which it will be um, moderated by Melanie Garcia from Latin American and Latino Studies. Uh, Melanie, are you there? Yes, hello, good evening, everyone. Hello, and well, thank you for moderating this Q&A, and let's start right now. All right, awesome. Hi, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the movie. Um, so just to kick things off, I kind of had my own um, input to make as far as the perspective um, that I kind of ended up leaving with at, by the end of the movie. I think it's really funny how it starts off with Mara really just reminiscing on her waning stardom. And from the beginning, it's very clear that she's caught up in what is no longer there. And she kind of has this delusion going on. So she comes across as this very old mad woman in a, in a sense, who's just caught up in this over the top persona. But by the end of the movie, I think things are actually more the way they seem in her mind than we at first think like her perception of the world around her has kind of been made out to fit her fantasy the the people around her have built the world to revolve around her and um we see how these men who she's built up resentment for have actually served her entirely in in her old age and by the end of it, they all kind of end up victorious and it's really their world and everyone else is kind of existing in it. But um, at the end of the day, Mara does end up being the person who's served more than anybody else. So I thought that was a little bit interesting to, to take a look at, but yeah, yeah. Um, please, uh, if you have questions, let the Q&A begin. Wonderful. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it was, um that's a great point right uh, of the movie and i would say that there's a lot of intertextuality in the film uh, obviously it's a movie about people making movies which of course they have it's has been people who are no longer active uh but uh basically they live uh through the memories and the past uh it reminds me a little bit of um, Sunset Boulevard with Norma Desmond, this actress from the, the, the times of the uh, silent films that she lives in this world of her own. And, and so how she perceives reality, you know, through her own movies. And, and here it happens a little bit, but also there is the twist of uh, old people versus young people, the new, the old, um, but yeah, um, as you said, let's see what everybody else uh, thinks about it. And there were some comments on the uh, in in the chat room that were very very good too. Um, so maybe we can bring them up uh, uh, now. I guess I, I will be checking in case there are comments on our YouTube channel also, and I'll let you know. Um, one comment that stood out to me, nunca me, me imaginé que así murieron las mujeres. Me tampoco um, creía que en verdad fue lo que creía Bárbara, mm -hmm. como ella, ella creía que eran los, los hombres que lo hicieron. Mm -hmm. um, I think they did a really good job of covering up everything for Mara so that she would benefit from it and kind of continue living in her little fantasy without walking around with the guilt of what she had done. So um, yeah, that completely blindsided me as well throughout the movie. I, I didn't see it coming that that's how the women ended up dying. Yeah, that's correct. I, I, I see Jeffrey has his hand uh, raised for a comment maybe. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of ask and kind of discuss the idea um, of, you know, an international movie, especially one that hasn't released uh, in a, in a English speaking country, and the usage of um, usage of English uh, like songs and English lyrics, I think is really interesting. I don't know if that's really a comment on the idea of how international like 
um, film is sort of with them both being, you know, an actress and a director um, separately. Um, I think it's really interesting their usage of, of uh, the director's usage of um, English, English movies and Eng or English music um, in their movie. I thought it was really interesting because I think that nearly all the songs are in English. So like if either of you guys have any comments you want to make on that, I'd be more than interested to hear. Oh, that is true. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think it has to do with uh, the idea of uh, film as an international vehicle of communication, I guess, and, and especially Hollywood films and how they cross over uh, cultures, um, probably. Uh, but yes, uh, if we ask the director, maybe, I don't know what he would say, but most um, the film directors, when they are asked about the music uh, they, that they use, they say, well, you know, uh, sometimes I just use something because it, it, it suits a scene rather than um, being uh, historically accurate. Even though those uh, songs were all from the 50s and and 60s, so in a way, uh, I guess that they have, um, they, they are somehow accurate in, in that context, even though they are in English, you're right, yeah. Um, another thing that, and I, and I read your comment in the chat room, Jeffrey, when you said that, that beautiful shot, uh, which is really, I think, my favorite too, when we have the old actress, uh, Mara, in front of the screen, and the screen is projecting her old films, which happens to be also the same actress when she was younger, and you could see how the, the old one, I mean, the younger um, actress fills the face of the of the old one and and that that is very meaningful and i think it's a very ingenious shot yeah, yeah. just to just to comment on that i think i'm i don't know if i'm remembering right but at the end of it it's kind of just like the white projector on her when she's telling her about the uh the supposed affair that she had which kind of symbolizes like the idea of purity um because at the end of the day you know she said that she was lying and she just kind of wanted to like bring up bring back the relationship. Um, so it kind of symbolizes and foreshadows the idea of purity, especially in the relationship. Um, and especially because the film a lot like painted the struggles between their, um, their relationship overall. So like even just like, even just the use of projector projectors in film isn't really used that often. And I thought, you know, it was a super unique way to show both age and the idea of as you said the inter what's it called mm -hmm. i'm the, sorry i didn't hear what you said the inter the inter something where it's showing like oh, intertextuality intertextuality exactly. yes. yeah so i thought i think it did an excellent job of doing that through using a projector and then it even goes as far as talking about purity and you know it goes further into just symbolism besides just you know the idea of projecting your your old face or your new face onto your your current face. I thought, you know, it was really, really interesting to do that. Yeah. Well, and, and also uh, something that very interesting, um, there are a lot of references to Argentine cinematography, classical cinematography, that of course, um, it's not something that it will be obvious to most people unless you are familiar with uh, Argentine cinema. Uh, but for example, uh, which I, I, I put that information in the chat and unfortunately when I was doing that, I think I, I stopped sharing the film. So <laughs> I had to go back to that. But anyway, when, when he has to sign up uh, his name and uh, uh, to go to the office uh, where the real estate company is, he, all the names he writes down are old, old classic uh, film directors. Uh, Hugo del Carril, uh, Daniel Tiner, uh, Hugo Sofici, uh, Sofici. Uh, he names all of them, okay? So, and this young woman doesn't know who they are. <laughs> uh, 
uh, which is interesting, right? It's like if it reminds me of Sunset Boulevard when when Norma Desmond says um, uh, before she goes into the world, say, "I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille." And of course, Cecil B. DeMille was the famous film director of all these uh, spectacular film, uh, uh, silent films uh, before sound, and they were all spectacular. And he was a great director and producer. And and she, which was a has-been because of sound movies, she was no longer relevant and is secluded in her Hollywood mansion. Um, the same way as Mara is secluded in her uh, mansion because she's no longer relevant in the world. And, and, uh, and if she thinks that she becomes relevant, it's because they're playing a, a hoax on her, the younger people, because they want the house and everything is orchestrated. Uh, so that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, same way as I, I'm sure you notice when, when there, it seems as if the movie is going to end and it says, well, I mean, there's no excitement, the, 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 the bad guys win. And so it's a boring ending, but let's fade, fade in into black. And the, uh, uh, and the scene is fading in, and then, but he says, there might be another act. <laughs> and that's the final act, which is precisely when um, they decide to do the, the, the plot, I mean, to right. kill them, which I is a little bit over the top, I think, in, in, unless you take it as, as black comedy and, and a little bit of a farce, I don't think you can, you can believe that that is possible. What do you think? I was actually going to comment on the way that that's done because throughout the movie, I think it must've been really fun the way that they kind of break the fourth wall because they're all supposed to be, you know, pros at the movie industry in one way or another while they're within this movie. And they, you know, they caught the communication with the audience throughout the, the movie is really mm -hmm. fun. Um, even in the very beginning where, he, where they're making this toast and they're saying, you know, to our friendship that hasn't been problematized in all these years. Um, and no one's really come along to mess it up. And it's just been a wonderful life. And then cue the villain and the dramatic music. It's very over the top. That, that's, but, that's so yeah. true. And, the, and you see his dark glasses and the reflection of the house. Yeah. I mean, that was a brilliant, brilliant shot, right? I mean, yeah. how you can see what is in his mind by looking at the reflection and mm -hmm. his shades. We see his objective from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the movie plays with that, plays with yeah. the genre, plays with, with film, with Hollywood films. It plays with that. Uh, but then it goes to a point in which obviously is the typical ending of a, an action type of comedy from probably the 30s or 40s, right? I, I don't know if you remember, um, I think it's the second uh, of um, Indiana Jones trilogy. Remember the second one, I think is Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom or something like that. That there is uh, the beginning of the movie, they are in this restaurant, there is this type of uh, show, like a musical show with all the, 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 the chorus girls uh, dancing, tap dancing to uh, Anything Goes. And then Indiana Jones is poisoned. And then there is the antidote, which is in a tiny little, little flask, little bottle, which is round. And when he's about to take it, they, they knock it off his hand and it starts rolling on the floor and they start fighting and he's trying to get the, the antidote and it's a big fight until he finally gets it open and drinks it. So there is a little bit of a, a intertextuality also with that type of Indiana Jones films, which in turn, Indiana Jones is intertextual with prior films from the golden age of Hollywood. So this is a movie for movie lovers, I think, for people who love cinema, because the more you have seen in your lives of films, 
the more you see the all the, the, the layers that this director is putting in, into the film. Um, and even in the future, when you see another movie, you say, oh yeah, exactly. That's what they, you know, the, the whole idea, uh, which by the way, and then I'll shut up and, and, <laughs> and, and let other people talk. Um, this movie is a remake of a previous film from this 1969, I think, called Old, I'm literal in the translation, Old Folks Don't, um, don't Like Arsenic or something like that, or Don't Use Arsenic, uh, lo, Don't Use. Los Muchachos de Antes, which Muchachos de Antes is an expression that means old folks, folks who are, you know, old, old folks. Los muchachos de antes no saben arsenico, which borrows the title from an older movie called Los muchachos de antes no saben gomina. Gomina is uh, uh, grease, the, the fix that you use for the spray you use for your hair, especially men. And um, which it was also a remake of a previous film called, with the same name, from the 1930s. So 1930s to 19, early 1960s to late 1960s to now 2019. So it's, um, uh, everything gets into the, the whole idea of why the movie is the way it is, I think. Um, Melanie, I think you froze or something. Oh, there you are. Yes, okay. I'm back. Okay, good, good. All right, yeah. so I shut up now. <laughs> uh, I wanted to make a comment on what you and Jeffrey both said earlier. Jeffrey had mentioned the the shot of the projection on Mara's face with her younger self, and um, something else that you mentioned that just kind of adds on to this parallel that's going on the entire time between youthful arrogance and then this old kind of wisdom mm -hmm. and I think usually I want to say in in typical movies at least in my experience I think it's always the youth who kind of best the old people mm -hmm. but in in this film it's quite the opposite where uh, Barbara and the other young man whose name escapes me right now uh, uh, they end up being blindsided yeah. what was his name again was it Fe, Fe, with an F? I think Federico Fede. No, something like that. She she calls him Fede. Francisco. Francisco. Okay. There we go. Yeah, good, Francisco. Good. So Francisco and Barbara um, come in with all the knowledge, or so they believe, because they've studied up on their rivals. But mm -hmm. you know, the the old people of the movie they end up gaining the upper hand and they use I guess these skills that they've acquired over the years about people and yeah given their backgrounds they they use it to their advantage and you know Barbara and Francisco just ended up overestimating themselves the whole time so it's just really interesting and funny how that plays out it's it's this big cat and mouse game throughout yeah. the movie and that was really fun to watch as well yeah and also okay. within the genre the idea of a moral the morals towards the end of the story, which they say, yeah, you know, nowadays with postmodernity and deconstruction, we don't expect morals, a moral story with a with a, with an ending that has that is uh, uh, it has a lesson, right? We 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 sort of frown upon that. We don't like that. We we think that movies now they have to have ambiguous endings and probably not happy endings because life is not happy. And so, in a way, they make a statement about that too. Um, I think. Um, plus, another thing that was interesting is how the older folks didn't understand the new jargon, the new words, the new expressions that younger people would use, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, on the topic of, I guess, the morals of the story, I think it's interesting how in that regard, there's a moral between 
the older folks and the younger folks, but also within the older, the group of older folks living in the house, Mara and Pedro and Martin, they are all going back to their own youth. Mm -hmm. And again, that kind of draws again on the projection that we see. And they, we see that there's these old, there are these old resentments coming up again that they Mm -hmm. didn't necessarily smooth over back in the day. So I kind of thought about how Francisco near the end, he says, you know, one day I realized I'll be old too. And, you know, in the same way, they were once young as well and and they made their share of mistakes. So it's, it's, um, it's well played out the way that all these things come up again. And, and they finally, this, this whole altercation um, gives them a chance to reflect on that and really address it whereas at the beginning of the movie we saw how they ignored all of that and they said that their friendship has been perfect their entire lives and we see that that wasn't necessarily very true and there was a lot that I I suppose they also had youthful arrogance as well and they just didn't bother to look about look at it and and think about it they just preferred to ignore it and and keep going with their with their lives so Yeah. yeah that's true and, and 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 another thing that it's uh interesting is um when when they plot the whole revenge the final act and and then because the 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 mara's husband is not a good actor he never he's never been a good actor so they they are afraid he won't be able to act out her death and so they don't tell him <laughs> and he's resentful not because they didn't tell him but because they didn't trust him as an actor that he could do it uh, i think melanie has her hand uh, yeah um so i thought it was extremely interesting how barbara was the one who at the end got the antidote because usually we see that within these relationships the man is usually the vil- the villain mm-hmm. it's usually the one that is like they were both overestimating themselves but I thought it was extremely interesting that she was the one that was also above him like she was superior to him she knew that she didn't she wasn't just an employee she was above she was freelance she's able to get a job wherever so I thought that dynamic was really interesting because I feel like in a lot of films we see that the man is the villain he gets the antidote in the end he's the one that betrays the woman and in this case it was the opposite yeah oh yeah that's that's another thing that the film has. It's a, uh, I would say, it's it's very contemporary and up to date in the dynamics of in the gender dynamics within the film. I would say, um, the women are the ones who are aggressive in terms of love and also in terms of survival, and. I love that scene when she is uh, when she says, "I'm all warm and wet," <laughs> and the husband replied, "I mean Mara, right?" When she's seducing him, and 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 he replies, "What did you eat? <laughs> you must have, you know, probably you ate too much last night." Like he, in his mind, he's not able to 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 accept that she might be interested in 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 making love. And and so it yeah it, it I think subverts all the I, I I think I don't know what 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 do you, the rest what do you think uh, I agree with Melanie that, that it was I mean Mel- Melanie Ramirez and Melanie Garcia too of course <laughs> yeah yeah that's um, that's a, that's a, do you think that uh, that point of view is changing in in cinema or 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 not all cinematographies have uh, are echoing that new way of portraying women and in film do you think it's a new change is something we're seeing more and more or 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 only some films and materials will show that
I, I don't really keep up to date too much with like uh, movies coming out in like the past few like few or so years. I usually like watch like older movies just to like you know just because that's what I'm more interested in. Um, but there's definitely a trend more so to try to you know give more power to women from what I've seen, mm-hmm. um, especially like in this movie. Just the idea of both uh, characters being able to have so much power. Um, one in you know literally being able to grab a gun and kill someone in the sense that you know it, it's kind of used as like a like a film tool sort of like the mm-hmm. like a screenwriting tool of just like the gun um, but at the same time she's the one who grabs the gun and as opposed to the other guy yeah. um, so I think that that really symbolizes the power and even just like the idea of the bracelet uh, and the transferring of the bracelet I think is very symbolic in that sense too um, cause it's not just the idea of, you know, women versus men. It's also about how women interact. Um, and it's really interesting from that perspective as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, uh, I, 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 there were other, other things that obviously, uh, the scene when they're playing pool and then they're playing chess and all this check and, uh, the way that life and it's almost like a game, right? A, 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 a competition uh, and how all that uh, plays along and, and, and goes with, with the plot, right? How, how they really move those pieces and, and especially how, uh, yeah. Now there is something that some, some reviews, some critics, um, highlight as, as, as something that is a, a weak uh, a weak point in the film the some of the the dialogues are a little stilted especially coming from the playwright do you think that that was on purpose or that was um, a flaw what do you think because i think that the only dialogues that are really stilted, I would say, maybe, you know, not maybe you see others, but are the ones coming from the playwright, the screenwriter, which obviously it seems as, as if his mind is wired to just produce that type of utterances that were fashionable in the films of the 30s and 40s and 50s in uh, especially in Argentine films. If you if you watch an old movie, you will see that those dialogues are very cinematographic, but they are they don't reflect real life. People don't didn't speak like that in real life, only in the movies. And the same thing happens if you go to an old Hollywood film, you know. Um, so I I think that that was part of the 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 presentation of the character i think it was part of the the movie but i agree uh-huh i think um it's de- it definitely is part of the character because they're all i mean the banter that they have all of that is very over the top and it's supposed to, i think it's supposed to adopt this idea that they have had a past with you know the film industry and mm-hmm that is reflected um especially as you're saying with um the the screenwriter it's just he's adopted it into his daily life maybe it's just a part of them reliving their youth and and their old stardom Mm -hmm. but i feel like it it did seem natural to me with their personas throughout the movie yeah yeah just to just start off at that point even you know francisco when he's quoting um one of the 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 things that the other person had written um it's really interesting because obviously like he's correcting himself he doesn't actually know it completely like it's very clear that he had just rehearsed it and it's not you know something that Mm -hmm. super dear to his heart like he says it is um but at the same time like personally i don't really like the idea of you know like using that sort of stuff um especially like i understand its use as like uh to kind of make the character seem a little bit you know living in the old times, but also kind of giving them the, it's kind of like if someone were to recite, you know, um, like, a, like a Yeats poem or, you know, like a, a Percy Shelley poem. Yeah. I, it kind of is like, you know, living in the past, but also to a fault. 
the idea of, you know, as respectable as metered poetry is, I think it's something that has um, obviously died in comparison to free verse over time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like the idea of like, no one really talks with it like that. So it's kind of out of touch of the idea of the community, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, I understand it, especially because like the entire movie doesn't have like working class representation really. No. Um, so I, I don't know. I just, I'm, I, I personally am not a fan. I understand why they, they would do so. And I understand your, your criticisms and it's definitely every character uh, mm-hmm. utilizes their language and, you know, the screenwriting obviously uh, proves the point of each character and their connection with old time movies and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I agree. And I would say that probably we understand why, why the script makes him speak like that, especially the script writer. It's part of the plot and it's part of the humor. The question would be, is it effective? Because after a while, maybe it gets a little bit on, on the audience, uh, audience's nerves, right? I mean, because if, if, if it had been less and not all the time, all the time, then, you know, it makes it a little bit too um, unrealistic, even though I, the intention was not to make it realistic. But it makes it a little bit of a, like after a while, I guess that we sort of... Uh, get disconnected from the character, probably. There is a comment I, I want to read in the chat it's a, um, from Melanie. It says, I think that it was internal because the references are so structured and well thought out. I don't think it was just a mere coincidence, intentional. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, it was intentional, not internal. So I think that's the correction. Yeah, 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 obviously it was. Um, besides, if 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 the the dialogues had been unintentionally bad, all the characters would have been bad, and this was only the screenwriter that was a little bit too far fetched in the way he he expressed himself. Um, I guess it's the type of person as a character that gets pleasure out of hearing himself talk, right? Uh, with big words, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I just dropped in the comments. Um, I agree with Jeffrey's point, and yeah, to that point, the plot itself is also very reflective of the privilege that they hold. The four mm-hmm. of them, mm-hmm. you know, the, because they're living there, um, having been successful in their careers and being well off, and not have to worry about paying bills constantly. Mara doesn't even think to look at, you know, the expenses that she has and they're just living lavishly throughout the film. So that's also something to keep in mind. Yes, that is true. Yeah, yeah. Just to build off of that point and off of what you were saying, um, you know, it's also kind of critiquing, separating, uh, you know, the idea of like the artist, artisan and the art class and separating that from, you know, a lot of art comes from working class and the idea of you know a proletariat struggle um Mm -hmm. so it's kind of separating the the elite of the elitism that's in film especially you know even today but more so in you know 1950s hollywood and i imagine the same thing as uh in argentine cinema as you were saying um so i think it's a really interesting critique and i think it's really really I think it's better not to have a working class character sort of in the movie, just because it further emphasizes the fact that they don't even think about that, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, But it also kind of shows like the idea that art as it is and as it's becoming uh, becomes a lot more commercialized and it's something that's profitable. Mm -hmm. Um, It's no longer people sometimes, because a lot of the times, especially with film, the bigger budget that you have, the more likely it's going to be successful. Despite the fact that, you know, movies like, um, I think, Tangerine, Tangerine? Mm -hmm. I don't remember what, but it was filmed on an iPhone. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was uh, incredible. And there's so many methods and things that you could do. Um, But if you don't have the money for it, then unfortunately you can't really create these fantastic movies that are super illustrious and super high budget. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's really showing the idea that these people are so 
you know, so involved with their wealth, even the people who you consider like the intelligentsia, who are the playwrights and, you know, the directors, mm-hmm. um, they're so far removed from the idea of class struggle that, um, that especially like not including a, a, a working class person throughout the movie further mm-hmm. emphasizes that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, now, this is a question I, I, I mean, I, I always wonder, and, and that's, uh, it shows that the world now is no longer, it's very difficult to, to separate nationalities, right? Um, obviously, the director is from Argentina. He, um, most of the cast, uh, the young woman, what, what was her name? I don't remember, but the... the, the Barbara. Act- Barbara, the actress who plays a young woman. She's actually Spanish. Um, I guess uh, because Spain put some money into the film, obviously it was a co-production. Um, they used some actors from Spain. So she's the only one I recognize that is not from Argentina. Uh, of course, she speaks with an Argentine accent. She, she's not using a Spanish accent. Um, but the film director, um, is he, how Argentinian is he? I mean, he was born there, he was educated there, he makes movies there, but he also makes movies here. I don't know if you're aware of this, but he directed many of Law and Order episodes. So he works for you know, the Hollywood establishment also. And uh, check some of the Law and Order episodes if you go to, you know, those pages where you have the list of all the episodes and put Juan Jose, um, um, uh, what was his last name? Uh, Campanella. Um, and, uh, and you'll see that he directed a few of those episodes. And so he he's in the in the business of making films. So my point is, did you see any aesthetics in the film uh, that are comparable with Hollywood aesthetics or or is it an absolute uh, exotic type of cinematography? Like when we saw, remember uh, Lucia, we saw, well, yeah, it's a Cuban film, but the aesthetics were Soviet, right? Um, it was comparable with that for, so, so to what extent um, now we can just draw a line and say, hey, this is from this country and this is from this other country. I don't know. I, I, I see that division less and less. I don't know if you agree or not. Yeah, I think it definitely speaks more on like the globalism that's evolving throughout, um, especially throughout the 21st century Mm. Um, and sort of movies having to kind of lose their identity for the sake of trying to uh, market themselves towards um, the American market or even European markets, Um, Mm. especially considering that the director had experience in the United States. It allows them to be able to recognize what things would appeal in Argentina and what things would appeal in the United States. Mm-hmm. So I think that they kind of towed the line pretty well. Um, yeah. But it, it's a shame. It's a shame that you know uh, movies are kind of losing their their nationalities and their styles. For example, you know there are there are movies that are coming out that you know still, especially like Soviet movie or Russian movies having, you know, roots in the Soviet tradition, like mm-hmm. uh, the return was really, really good. I think it's called, um, and it so holds true to even the color palette, but even just kind of like the cinematography and everything of, of Soviet visuals. Um, but it, it's really sad to see, especially because Argentine cinema is so unique and so respected in terms of being one of the, you know, few big markets of film out there. So it's kind of sad to see the, the globalization uh, being present throughout film where people are trying to appeal to, you know, the globalized culture, which really is American culture at the end of the day. Mm. Um, so I, I definitely, I feel like this movie is very accessible for that reason where anyone could watch it and understand it. Um, besides obviously the film references, but I feel like the story is easy to follow enough and it's, you know, kind of filmed in that Hollywood, uh, way. Yeah. where really it could appeal to American audiences really, really well. 
uh, Melanie. Yeah, I also, I agree. I see, I can see in terms of like dress and the presence in the house, like everything's very generic. It doesn't like, nothing comes out to me differentiating it, differentiating it from other movies that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the only things that I was able to, mo to notice was the language, obviously, because it was in Spanish. They say ni mu. Mm -hmm. In Colombia, we don't say that. So I think that was like only like one of the, or like when she says, fush, fush. Mm -hmm. That's another saying that obviously you're able to distinguish with Argentinian, like, I guess, like slang. Well, but, to be honest, I mean, I expression. didn't recognize fush, fush. That's too new for me. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I, I but, understood it in the context, but I never heard that before. Right. So I think that was the only like distinguishing mm -hmm. factor in terms of like knowing ethnically where they were yeah. from. Otherwise, their dress. Yeah, I think everything else was it could have been from anywhere. Yeah, yeah, and even among them or between them, like for example, the young young people nowadays in Argentina, when something is super cool, uh, fantastic. I mean, the the they say lo más the most, no? Just that, lo más. This is lo más, esto es lo más, right? And she doesn't, I mean, uh, Mara didn't understand that. When, when she says, lo, you're lo más, right? Saying you're the, the most, uh, the, the, the heapest, whatever. Um, she said, lo más, lo más, lo más. Lo más is a, is a, is a family name, lo más is a, is a, is a so she thinks they're referring to a name, Lomas, um, because Lomas doesn't exist in her uh, repertoire of, 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 of linguistic terms. So even within the characters, there are communication problems. So yeah, that's a good point. And then of course, uh, I, and th I think um, before we go, um, and I don't know, Melanie will, will be the one determined that, um, but um, what can we say about the the title, the Weasel's Tale? I mean, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask that actually about like the whole idea and the the reference to weasel hunting. Um, yeah. I wanted to hear both of you your opinions on you know what you think it symbolizes and the the role of the weasel. Mm -hmm. Any any ideas? Um... Well, from my end, I was trying to put that together the whole movie as well. And there are hints of it, you know, because from the beginning, they're trying to exterminate this weasel problem. Mm -hmm. And then they have another problem that they're trying to exterminate, obviously. Um, but I just tried to make notes of every time there, there was a reference to it. And there's one part that really stood out to me where it's this foreshadowing and Mara says, stop shooting the weasels like they're young and they're vital yeah. and and then in response martin says well it looks like that weasel was mortal so obviously that's a big parallel with barbara and francisco yeah um uh, because they they seem to hold themselves at a pedestal and they feel untouchable and they think that they're so crucial to any type of progress that's going on in the world and that these old people are like senile and op like their their perfect their purposes are obsolete mm -hmm. and in reality you know they they for i mean this is the dark comedy aspect is that they were easy to take out <laughs> yeah. um they they did it themselves they made it easy like they barely had to get their hands dirty mm -hmm. the folks of the house barely had to get their hands dirty because at the end of the day they took one another out yeah um with their own foolishness so and and then at the very end you know there's this thing said like you know you don't chase weasels but they come they come to you yeah. and yeah i guess just again drawing in this youthful arrogance and believing that you're kind of invincible but in reality there there's more there's more to the situation um that might be blindsiding you and yeah. putting you at a disadvantage yes melanie also had her her hand up um, I think in terms of like speaking to weasels, how they represent like vitality and they're full of life. I think that's also, it also connects to um, Mara's desperation to feel this vitality, to 
you know, experience this or vicariously live through this and essentially be able to live on our own, like just uh, like when her and Pedro uh, just began. But it's also, again, like that idea of um, deceitfulness mm -hmm. of, you know, of lying, of, of, you know, just basically trying to trick them. So I think that was also like the theme, you know, that they were being tricked and in her desperation to to experience his vitalness, she didn't see what was right in front of her. Yeah, the weasel always in, in literature and in, in folkloric references always represents a predator, but a person who is the lowest, right? The lowest of all of them, maybe because they attack chicken, chicks, you know, when they're very young and they eat eggs, uh, they eat the eggs and they, they sort of attack animals that are very dear to us. So the weasels have always had a negative connotation in literature and in, 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 in sim symbolically, they are uh, people who have no scruples, who are the lowest of everything. And so always after an interest, always after trying to gain something and deceiving and, and betraying. So basically the younger, the, 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 the two uh, real estate agents uh, were the ones who were the weasels. They only, they didn't care about the house. They didn't care about them. They just wanted to develop a, a, a complex, a, some kind of a new, um, development. So they only care about money um, and not about preserving the house, but really caring about them. I mean, it was, um, yeah, uh, uh, I think that they are basically the, the weasels. But another scene that was very interesting is that the spider, <laughs> when the spider is in the tube and, and then she, uh, she gets it and smashes it with, with her foot. She's not scared about it. That's another representation of, of this woman as not getting scared because of a spider or screaming or running away. No, she takes care of it, right? Yeah. And the weasel takes care of the spider. Um, yeah. All right. That was, well, wow, very interesting comments. Okay. Any more questions before we wrap things up? All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a pleasure. What a great discussion. And I hope you all enjoyed the film tonight. Remember that uh, this recording will be available on the Spanish and Latino Studies YouTube channel. So make sure to check that out and hope to see you at the next film forum. Yes. Thank you. Take all care, right. everyone. Have a good night. Hey, you too. Bye.